Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. In our continued series in History 102, we're going to do South Asia after 1945. Chaos, war, success, collapse. So we start with the British Raj. The British controlled what was called British India, which went from the Indus River all the way to the jungles of Myanmar, Burma. It went from the Himalaya mountains to the sea. It had 300 million people in it. And then Gandhi comes along. Not the first independence-minded person. Not the last. Not even in some ways the most transformational. But the most galvanizing. Gandhi was a British trained lawyer and he used the British constitution and European enlightenment to demand independence. He said, John Locke says all men are created equal. And the Brits say yes. And he says, so how about you treat us like we're equals? And the Brits said, no. And he said, but you believe in John Locke? And they said, yes. It's like, so apply it to us. And they're like, no, we make a lot of money. And you're brown. And we're wild. Oh. Now, problematically, Gandhi, being a historical figure, is complicated. He was okay with apartheid in South Africa because it benefited the Indians in South Africa. Indians were considered colored. That's with a U. And because of that, they had rights. Whereas the black people, remember in, a, in apartheid, white people get all the rights, black people get no rights. But then there's mixed race and or what was called colored people who got some rights. And so apartheid worked out for Indian immigrants, for other people in the, in the British Empire who weren't black South Africans. His big argument was for nonviolence, which is misunderstood as you don't attack other people. The big part is not that you don't attack other people. It's that you accept the violence done to you. You don't. It's not that you avoid violence. A lot of people um, mistake nonviolence as trying to be a pacifist. That's not Gandhi at all. It's not avoiding violence. It's forcing the other side into violence. And you accept the violence done onto you. And that gives you the moral victory because it makes the other side look bad. How could be what they want be good if they're committing violence to maintain it? This is the... Um, um, the lunch counter sit-ins throughout the South during, during black civil rights. Those people who sat down were not violent. They were not going to fight back. That doesn't mean they weren't looking for a fight. They were. They wanted the people to attack them. They had to accept the violence done onto them. Only then... Did ordinary people look at this go, whoa, that's horrible. You shouldn't, he's not doing anything. It's the moral victory. And that becomes the model for independence and in in the civil rights in the United States. Now, Gandhi's murdered by a conservative. He's murdered by a Hindu nationalist. Because Gandhi didn't want the British Raj to partition, to break up. He wanted in uh, Hindu Indians and Muslim Indians and Sikh Indians to live together as they had been. And a Hindu, a conservative Hindu nationalist murdered him. So Gandhi, a Hindu, is murdered by a fellow Hindu. So what are our problems? What's the problems with India? As the British prepare to leave, the British have won World War II, but they are poor, and they're looking at India, and there's problems. First is religion. We've talked about this in part one of our class. Education. 
all in income, all equal divides. Religion between Sikh, Muslim, and Hindu. Education levels, income levels. Islamic politics dominated an oppressed Hindu majority. That goes back to the Mughal Empire. The Islamic citizens were wealthier. They were better educated. They were more tied to international trade. That was true going back to uh, Babur and probably back to Mahmud. There's also history. That Islamic invasions from Afghanistan equaled violence. The British divided and conquered. They gave guns and power to minorities. They allowed a lot of kings to stay in charge. So the administration of the British Raj was a, a patchwork, a quilt. The only thing keeping India together was British economic and military power. And then there's the problem of democracy. In a democracy, the majority will win elections, especially if they vote as a bloc, which means if you are a Muslim and you are one of the 10% minority of the country, or you're Sikh and you're even a smaller percentage, you will never win an election again. You will have no power. Your power will be taken away from you. So there is a huge fear of what will happen if the British leave. Will the Hindu majority seek violence and retribution <coughs> for hundreds of years of oppression? Who knows? Will they simply run the democracy and and reduce Sikhs and Muslims to an disempowered minority? What about all the different ethnic groups? Like, okay, they might be Muslim or they might be Hindu. But barely, or not even barely. But that's not their major identity. Their language group, their Punjabi, their Pashtun, their Deccan. What does that mean? What does their ethnicity mean now? And so what happens is in 1947 this partition lord mountbatten uncle stepdad to uh prince philip the uh queen consort uh, a man of immense uh, legitimacy was made basically basically given the order by the king to go and give india back to the indians But basically how he did it was, here you go, good luck. And the UK left. They pulled their forces out, they left. And what happened is immediately India fell apart. Jinnah leads a Muslim separation. The idea that the Muslims of the Indus River Valley and the Muslims of um, the Ganges Delta, where we've talked about before, need their own country. Nehru wants a united India under a Hindu-led democracy. And what this turned into was massive violence and ethnic cleansing. As the Indian parts split off or tried to get their independence and pulled apart, that left minorities in both sides who had lived in these areas for hundreds of years, you have Hindus who are living in Pakistan. It's not yet Pakistan. And no one knows where the border quite will be. And you have Hindus living in Bangladesh. And again, no one knows exactly where the borders are right now. You also have Muslims who are living in what would have been called Hindustan, in the land of the Hindus, who are a minority. Remember, Delhi is in the middle of the Ganges River in its length and its breadth. And that was a Muslim city, not, not a um, Hindu one. 
Well, that's going to be the new capital of a democratically Hindu India. Well, what happens to those million Muslims? And what happens is massive violence, ethnic cleansing, genocide. If you are a Indian student, uh, a student of South Asian descent, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Indian, and you have not talked to your parents or your grandparents about the partition, do so. It will blow your mind. I've had students since the beginning when I used to, I used to do a um, an essay in which I told students, which I told students the assignment was go talk to a member of your family about one event we discussed. Go that they would have lived through. Right. Go talk to one, and I I highly encourage it to be somebody you don't ordinarily talk to. You know, a grandparent you don't ordinarily talk to, an uncle you rarely see. Go talk to somebody and ask them about this event. And I have had Indian and Pakistani students come, Bangladeshi students come back and be like, I asked them about partition. And holy shit, professor. My mother had to hide as a child underneath uh, the train underneath the seats while guys got on and shot people. I'm like, yeah, that's what we're talking about. Partition is the largest movement of people in history. 10 million people are displaced. Up to 2 million people are murdered. The land is claimed by who lived there. So it meant if you were not the majority, you needed to move. You got out because you were going to be a permanent minority. And then terrible thing, no one would protect you. And so people were trying to get from India to Pakistan, from Pakistan to India. And there were, there were nationalist groups who wanted to control more of the border. And so we're perfect, the, the way you win a democracy is you get more votes. One way you get more votes is make sure the other side has less people as what would happen in Rwanda. You could have a democracy if you murder all the opponents. And so this is a massive trauma. If you are of South Asian descent, you are, if you're probably not old enough to have participated in this, so you are the descendant of this trauma. This is a trauma your parents or your grandparents are still carrying with them. As India, as the as South Asia ripped itself apart, I highly encourage you to ask those stories before they're gone. What happened? Because they're never gonna they they're never gonna come and talk to you. They're never gonna come and say, "Hey, do you know the time I survived the genocide?" You're gonna have to ask. So what happens is India breaks up. It breaks up into Pakistan, west along the Indus, and east in Bengal. India, what was traditionally known as Hindustan, but it was 30 languages, 100 cultures. Sri Lanka, which is Tamil and Buddhist. Bhutan, which is Buddhist. Nepal, which is Hindu. Burma, which is Buddhist. So one place, the British Raj, Broke up. If you ever took my 101 class, we talk about how India constantly breaks up. We should have talked about this in, in part one of this class, that, uh, that the geography and the cultures are so diverse that India is constantly in a state of breaking up. And that's the history. It continues to break up. So one land, the British Raj, broke into a Pakistan, an India, a Sri Lanka, a Bhutan, a Nepal, and a Burma. That's six places all with their own administrations. Then Pakistan breaks into two places, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Sri Lanka has a 20 long year civil war where it's effectively two different countries. West Pakistan, as we speak right now, is breaking up between the Pashtuns, who are related to the people of Southern Afghanistan, and the Punjabs. West Pakistan could easily divide into seven ethnically homogeneous countries. If you go up and take a look, at the map that I have, you could count one, two, three, there's seven or so different colors. Those are 
ethnic majorities. They could create seven or so major different countries. The Afghan war from 2002 to the present, it looks like it's going to end in 2021, we'll see, is really a terror war about reuniting Pashtun land. The culture is more important than the borders. The Pashtuns are on both sides of that border. They're in Af southern Afghanistan. They make up the majority of southern Afghanistan, and they make up the majority of western Pakistan. This is why if you fought in Afghanistan, you were the war was always going to be lost. From the very beginning, we were never going to stay long enough. Because the people of western Pakistan are cousins to the people of southern Afghanistan. The border is meaningless. They move across the border with ease. Meanwhile, American troops couldn't. American troops could not invade Pakistan in order to clear out the Taliban, clear out the terrorists. The one exception to that was Osama bin Laden. But even that, if you've watched some of the movies, was fraught with will we, won't we, should we, shouldn't we? Because if you got caught, you could start a war with Pakistan. Which tells you Pakistan was kind of hiding Osama bin Laden. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but when you're that far in Pakistan and Pakistan is making a billion dollars a year off of an American war hunting him, that's the kind of guy who's under like house arrest in Pakistan. He's more valuable to the Pakistanis alive than dead, which is exactly what happened. He, he was dead and we stopped paying the Pakistanis for the war on terror. But you can't fight because the people of Western Pakistan are naturally connected to the people of Southern Afghanistan. So we were always going to lose. The Afghanistan, Af Afghani war was always going to be a defeat. And Afghanistan itself is going to break apart along ethnic lines. Just like Pakistan is. Just like Pakistan is in the process of doing. So history continues. These are not countries that last long, especially if they don't have strong governments. So we also get a series of India-Pakistan wars. There are three wars and India wins them all, despite Pakistan and the U.S. alliance. You would think Pakistan, who which is richer, which is better educated, which is more connected to world trade, which is more advanced and connected to the United States, would win. No, it loses them all. They lose in 1947, and India takes Kashmir. In 1965, Pakistani, Pakistan helps insurgents in Kashmir. There's always Pakistani helping insurgents in Kashmir. It's a terrorism started an Indian invasion. They're like, enough of this shit. Enough of this Pakistani helping terrorism. And so, boom. India wins again. Which then leads to terrorism in Kashmir from... Uh, and after 1979, terrorism in Afghanistan. The idea being that Pakistan has to control its borders. It wants Kashmir back. Kashmir was is a Muslim-majority state, but it's in India. Um, it has to control Afghanistan because that's where the invaders come, constantly come from. And so, but it can't send an army. If it sends an army, the Indian army will invade Pakistan and crush it. So what do they do? Support terrorist groups. It's 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 asymmetrical warfare from 1970-65 on. They're basically supporting various different groups. This is kind of what, what Iran does in the Middle East. It supports groups that are willing to do the violence for them. And so they get a plausible deniability. But the Taliban works for Pakistan. To make no mistake... To pa Taliban has been living in Pakistan for the last 20 years. They're being paid by the, the Taliban, so they were always going to win. They were always going to take over Afghanistan, and they're in the process of doing so as the United States leaves. And the reason why is Pakistan must control southern Afghanistan. So if Pakistan itself cannot control it, it must have an ally there. That's History just tells us this. It's always been true. In the 70s, Pakistan breaks apart. Bangladesh gets its independence. India helps rip Pakistan apart so that Bangladesh can become independent. That doesn't mean Pakistan, the 
guys in West Pakistan were all that nice. They were military dictatorships. They weren't very nice. They weren't very nice to the Bangladeshis. But the Bangladesh nationals were a different ethnic group than West Pakistan. They were a different ethnic group. So this is another ethnic independence of decolonization. But it feel it again seeds the sea seeds the fields of hatred between these two countries. That India is always doing something mean to Pakistan, and Pakistan is always suffering. And so, in order to deal with India, the Pakistan military must be in control of the government. The Pakistan military must be better armed. The Pakistan military must have authority within Pakistan. And so, democracy fails in Pakistan. While it continues in India. Now, we can argue about how good democracy is going on right now in with the current governments in India, but it's still democracy. And what happens is by the 70s, India's real competition is no longer with Pakistan. It's with China. And so they need nukes. Pakistan is this annoying cousin that doesn't really matter. And India is the largest democracy in the world. In a world where nationalism matters. And it's the idea that India is one of the world's great countries. It's not poor, even though it's poor. And so you get this idea that India is going to need nukes in order to fight communist China, defend its borders. And who cares about Pakistan? They don't matter. But Pakistan is in competition with India. So Pakistan needs nukes to say we matter. You have to care about us. We, we, we can annoy you. We're important. So you get the militarization of government in Pakistan. You get political instability. You get coups. The military runs the government. So you get minimal social services. And you get lots of poverty. Why? The military takes most of the, most of the money for itself in order to compete with India in a competition India doesn't really care about. You can see why this is all messed up. So Pakistan's military coups equal a weak state, which equals the reversal of 1947 when Muslims were better off than Hindus. The world you live in now is Indian Hindus are better off than Pakistani Muslims. That wasn't true for basically the last thousand years. It's only the instability in, the, in, in Pakistan that has so destroyed the gifts that the Indus River Valley gives. Kashmiri ter terrorists basically have independence and support from the military, and so they're constantly at a war with India. Northwestern Pakistan is essentially its own state, and it's at war with the United States. Pakistan in 2020 is close to a failed state. In 2010, it was the most terrorized nation on earth. So it's got terrorist groups that it can't control. It's got a military that wants to dominate the government. It's got a weak democracy, if democracy at all. It's poor because it's, it has uh, wasted its gifts. Meanwhile, India becomes larger, keeps getting bigger. By 1990, it's six times larger than, than Pakistan. Muslims in India are better off than in Pakistan if, and there's a big if here, there's no ethnic violence. And every few years, there is ethnic violence. You get Hindu nationalists going through towns, murdering Muslims. But if you can avoid that, you're better off. Is India the new China? Is it a futurist 21st century superpower or is it too big to unify? We don't know yet. That's going to be the, that's the major question. The history would tell you that India will fall apart. That it will not remain one United Nation state. But that's history. That's not the future. What about culture? In culture, British culture maintains with South Asian adaptions. It's still British culture, Indian style, Pakistani style, Bangladeshi style. Cricket 
is the favorite sport. It was a sport of the upper class colonial English. It is a sport of sophistication. It is Western. And it is with pride that teams from India and Pakistan and Bangladesh consistently beat English teams. Don't don't think for a second they don't care that the colonial power, the colonialists, the, col the colony beats the colonial power. I mean, we're Americans. We do the same thing to the English all the time. The university system is based on the English model. Even though elites, Indian elites, and the best and the brightest still go to English universities, still go to Cambridge and Oxford and East Anglica and come increasingly to the United States as if it's still 19, 1900. English is the second most spoken language in India, but less than 1% speak it as a first language. So that idea of the British making them our, our English brown brothers never really happened. Just like they knew it wouldn't. They spoke big and did little to, to make it. But there's Bollywood. There's music. Uh, there's not food. Food, they don't import the stuff from Britain. Instead, they export, especially curry, Indian flavors, uh, peppers, spices to Europe, to England. It's not the other way around. Indian assimilation of sophisticated English culture, but not football, not working class English culture, which is interesting. They took cricket. They did not take football. Conservatives want to make Indian culture more Indian post-colonialism, to make India India again, whatever that means. And there's no agreement on what that means because India is so big and so diverse. But liberals want India to be more globalized, more American, especially young, educated women. To be more European in a lot of ways, more part of the global educational, cultural, trade world. They're democratic. They are um, English speaking. They have excellent senses of humor. Let's, let's not go back to be more quote unquote Indian. Let's be more global. So that's the current fight right now that, that the prime minister Modi in, 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 uh, inhabits he is because he's a conservative he's a nationalist he wants to make india indian again but indian liberals want to be more global and that's the world we we live in we live in a world in of south asia that has been falling apart remember we talked about this in part one you start with the united india and then it falls apart and so we are living in the ramifications of that Bangladesh splits away from West Pakistan and becomes its own Muslim state. Problematically, it's surrounded by Indian, by Hindu India. And Buddhist Burma to its east. Um, it's also low lying. So climate change is going to be a disaster for the 200 million Bangladeshis. In the West is Pakistan, which is falling apart. It's There's no cohesion. There's no cultural cohesion. There's no governmental cohesion. There's, there's the military holding it together in order to fight a war that they'll lose because they really can't defeat India anymore because India has become so much bigger, so much richer. Even though it's poor, poor per capita, it's sheer size would overwhelm Pakistan in any Pakistani Indian war. So what you now have is a bunch of conflicts in which the different participants, at least one participant in the conflict doesn't care about the other participant in the conflict and isn't really in the conflict. So people are fighting with other people who aren't fighting with them. And that's South Asia at the moment. You have Nepal, which has an on again, off again, civil war. You've got Bhutan, which is this isolated kind of hermit kingdom of Buddhism, you know, where they measure things not in gross domestic product, but gross domestic happiness. 
you know, they're in the Himalayas, so climate change is a problem for them and Nepal. Um, you've got on the other side of the mountain, Chinese Tibet, and the Chinese are committing some form of cultural assimilation and destruction in Tibet. So there's your co religionists on the other side of the mountains. There's, there, it's a mess. Even as India makes money, becomes one of the global powerhouses, will it be the next China growing at 10% a year? Or will climate change and ethnic strife ruin that? That's for another class. That's for a future class. That's for a future. So thank you.